Okay, so we're, we're ready to go ahead with the final presentation of today before we go to the posters. Um, and I just wanted to start with a little bit first of context to the President's address. Um, because it's a relatively new tradition to the EPS. Um, the first time that we did a President's address was when the EPS went to Canada, St. John's, um, to join the Canadian Experimental Psychology Society. And they invited our then President, Celia Hayes, to give a President's address. Um, following the success of that event, we then brought it back to the UK um, and John Duncan gave a President's Address at the January 2020 meeting, which in the end turned out to be the only in-person meeting that took place during his two-year presidency. Um, and today, obviously, we have Cathy Russell's President's Address, um, which will be slightly, which has been slightly delayed towards the end of her two-year period at President, um, really because of those COVID reshuffling of prizes and symposia. So it's really great that we get to do this, obviously, before Cathy steps down. And the reason that we think it's so important to do these President's Addresses and that we're trying to keep this tradition going is that really as a committee and as a membership, we select our Presidents for the Society based on the excellent high quality of the research that they conduct, um, based on uh, their esteem that they're held with in the field and the contributions that they make to our discipline, and also the sorts of leadership roles and mentoring that they offer to people in our field. And so... Cathy is an excellent representation of these things. Um, so to give a little bit of a background specific to Cathy, so Cathy began her education and training in the US and Australia, and she moved to the UK in 2002 to take up an academic position at Royal Holloway, where she's remained ever since, um, and during that time has taken on significant roles um, at Royal Holloway, including as head of school and also as um, the associate vice principal for research. She's also made significant contributions across the discipline, um, taking on um, significant roles, um, particularly in the ESRC, in the REF, um, and also as the EPS president, um, and has then a significant input into the strategic direction of research in experimental psychology. So Cathy is most well known for her excellent research in language, literacy, and learning. Um, and she uses experimental methods as well as computational modeling to try and understand um, reading and especially reading acquisition. Um, the high quality of this work has been recognized by numerous awards, including the EPS Mid-Career Prize, which was awarded in 2017. And I think one of the things that makes um, the experimental work and the scientific um, contribution that um, Cathy makes so special is the societal impact that she manages to translate from that work. Um, so the research from Cathy's lab has significant roles in improving policies, practice, especially around education and reading um, where there might be difficulties. And that's recognized across the world in um, invitations to serve on panels, reports, and policy documents. And it's also been recognized by the ESRC in an impact prize in 2020. So it's great to see that uh, Cathy has chosen to talk to us today about how her work in experimental psychology has led to making a difference um, and the impact of that research. So with no further ado, thank you. Thank you colleagues for having me and Heather for that very generous introduction. So as Heather said, I was fortunate enough to give an EPS mid-career prize lecture a few years ago. So I've decided to do something a little bit different today. And I guess reflecting over the last two years of my presidency, I often hear at EPS people talking about how their work has implications for some aspect of, of real world um, act activity, but it's much less common to see those impacts in action. So for example, I've seen fantastic talks about how difficult it is to do face matching and then the next thing I find is that the government now asks local election officials to match my face to my, my ID, right? So many of you will know that I have, over the last decade, chaired a number of ESRC boards and committees. And through those roles, I've seen where experimental psychology is very successful and where it's less successful. So we're brilliant at crafting rigorous experiments, and our designs allow us to get at cause better than any other social science. And yet it's often very difficult to take these experiments and translate them into real world impacts. And that's a deficiency. 
because outside of academia, to many funders and to government, impact is really the, the thing that really, really counts. And so in my view, developing ways to translate our science into tangible in, impacts is one of the key goals to lifting the status and the funding coming into our discipline. So today I'm going to talk about how work in experimental psychology on reading is transforming global literacy uh, policy and practice, and that's something that I've become very interested in over the last few years. And I hope that I'll be able to uh, take some general lessons that could apply to other fields as well. So I've studied reading over the past 25 years, and I've come to see it as a pretty tricky problem. So the sentence I've got in front of you is just trivial. And if you were a parent thinking about how you might teach your child to read, you might be tempted to say, just read it. But that, the, the ease to the adult skilled reader of reading this really belies a great deal of complexity. So to the person who's not literate, these are just arbitrary lines, squiggles, and dots. Right? And they're also highly confusable. We also need to know that these arbitrary lines, squiggles, and dots stand for something. And they usually stand for sounds. But they don't, there's not always a one-to-one -one mapping between those symbols and sounds. And sometimes they also stand for meanings. So for example, the LY stands for more than it sounds. We've got the challenge of computing the meanings of these individual words. But that's not trivial, because we've got words like face, which have multiple meanings. And we've got expressions like cut and run, which are not the sum of their parts. And we do all of this visual and linguistic processing at incredible speed, far more rapidly than we can engage with spoken language. And we do it using an eye movement system that's beautifully tuned to allowing us to pr process vast amounts of text rapidly. So you can see that reading is complex and multifaceted. And this also characterizes the nature of the vast research base. So when we think about how that knowledge might be applied to teaching, it's actually you know, it's hard to know where to start. So what I want to do is bring together seven insights that I consider to be particularly important in thinking about how we read. And then I'll turn to how those insights are driving um, changes in global literacy policy and practice. So the first major insight is that reading is a skilled behavior. Despite its apparent ease, it's not something that comes naturally, and it's not something that we're born to do. So as a psychologist Steven Pinker says, children are wired for sound, but print is an optional accessory that must be painstakingly bolted on. Learning to read requires substantial neurocognitive learning across at least four dimensions. First, the brain needs to learn to discriminate the highly confusable visual symbols of writing. And from an ecological point of view, this is a very unusual stimulus. But it needs to retain sufficient flexibility to be able to recognize variations in case or font. Second, the brain needs to build an interface between systems for vision and for language. And as Stanislaus de Haen has shown, to retune neurons built for face and object recognition so that those neurons can become specialized for recognizing the symbols of writing. And that basic interface is the same across skilled readers of different languages and writing systems, as shown here in this beautiful study by Jay Ruppel and his colleagues. So what you can see is the pink shows areas of the brain that are activated both by spoken language and by print. And critically, that would not occur in someone who does not know how to read. Print would not activate spoken language regions. Third, the brain needs to build an eye movement system tuned for reading in a particular writing system. The eye movement system is the vehicle that delivers information to the linguistic system at the right time. And that has to be learned through experience. And fourth, we're only just beginning to appreciate the incredible challenge of written language, which is so much more sophisticated in vocabulary and syntax than spoken language. And in fact, in a recent study, uh, it showed that the only form of spoken language that even approaches written language is expert witness testimony. And so while we think about reading as something that occurs in the first few years of primary school, it's actually something that takes around 10 years of instruction and practice to reach proficiency. So the second major insight is that reading is a mapping problem. So the process of learning to read is the process of linking the visual symbols of writing to spoken language. And that is a non-intuitive problem. 
Language is so much more than a string of individual phonemes, as shown by my favorite felon here, who's uh, one of the great communicators. Now, English has an alphabetic writing system, and what I mean by that is that letters uh, stand for sounds. So the initial learning of, of English and other alphabetic writing systems makes heavy use of the pathway uh, between spelling and sound. Chinese is very different. So Chinese characters need to be learned as wholes. Chinese characters have individual meanings, and these typically combine to make compound words. In the case of vase, for example, which combines the characters for flower and bottle. And so the learning of Chinese makes heavy use of this pathway between spelling and meaning. And this, these insights about the division of labor in reading pathways have come from the computational modeling of reading. For example, the work of David Plout, Jay McClelland, and their colleagues. And they're really important because they remind us that instruction is intimately tied to the writing system. The point of initial reading instruction is to help the child to understand how a particular writing system represents language. So the third fundamental insight is that explicit instruction is necessary for building these mappings. Now there's been a kind of myth that's just been very pervasive in this field, that reading feels so natural that if we're just exposed to lots of books, we'll just, we'll just pick it up. You know, we're statistical learners. And we wanted to find out how successful undergraduates would be at discovering the underlying structure of a writing system in the absence of explicit instruction. So we brought undergraduates into the lab and we taught them a new language uh, written in artificial orthography. And they learned this new language over a period of 10 days, two hours per day. And there were two groups. One simply did that. They came in, they learned the words, a variety of different tasks, reading aloud tasks, meaningful tasks, etc., two hours a day. The other group, instead of the first day of training, they got 30 minutes of explicit instruction explaining how these writing systems worked. And I'll tell you how they work. So in the case of, of uh, this here, the first three uh, letters here stand for sounds. So that would be b, a, v. The last symbol is silent and stands for the semantic category. So you can see that that last symbol is fruits and vegetables, and this last symbol is animals. And we were interested not just in whether they could learn these words over 18 hours of instruction and training, but whether they could discover that underlying structure. And the way that we probe that is through a generalization task. So we give them words like this, which they hadn't seen before, and asked if they could read them aloud, and whether they could guess what the possible meaning was between two alternatives. And so if you have discovered that underlying structure, you should be able to read this aloud, because you know what those symbols represent. And if you have discovered the underlying structure of that semantic, uh, we'll call it a semantic marker, at the end, you should know that that is a carrot. Here are the data. So what I'm plotting here is simply the participants who, who had a good level of generalization. So this is people who get 75% accuracy on the generalization task. And remember, these are undergraduates. You know, they, they're highly educated. They're skilled readers. They've had 18 hours of training. And you can see that for the explicit instruction group, there was very good generalization basically across the board. Participants got the spelling sound relationship, they got the spelling meaning relationship, and you can see that, that almost everyone got both of those rules. The people left to discover the underlying structure just through practice on the words, they did very badly. Less than a quarter of them had actually discovered that mapping. Right? And this is actually very similar to what we see in the classroom. If you leave children to discover how to read, some of them will discover how to read, but most won't. But on the other hand, there's a really positive message here that you know, explicit instruction is really powerful. It comprised less than 3% of the training time, but totally transformed the learning outcomes. So my fourth insight really combines the second and third key insight, and that is that phonics instruction provides the optimal start for learning to read in an alphabetic writing system. So English is an alphabetic writing system, and by that I mean that letters stand for sounds. It happens to be a, a particularly challenging writing system for a couple of reasons. The first is that the symbols of writing don't always stand for the same sounds. So you can see in the 
words I've got up here, the letter G can be G, J, or silent. I think an even more difficult problem is one of grain size. So a single sound can be represented by one, two, three, or four visual symbols. Four, as in the case of A, for eight, in eight. So you can see how difficult it would be for a child coming to this for the first time not to have any instruction on how that writing system works. So phonics is a package of systematic, explicit instruction on how the writing system works, what letters are and what they represent. And we've known for many decades that this is the most effective, efficient way to facilitate the first steps of reading acquisition. And what phonics allows a child to do is to translate that visual, visual series of visual symbols into a spoken language representation that they can then use to compute the meaning from their oral language knowledge. Now, phonics provides the optimal initial instruction, but it's not the learning. Becoming a skilled re reader requires extensive practice over many, many years. So phonics gives children the tools to access text independently, and it's through that access to text and that text experience that the learning occurs. And that's a process that we call self-teaching. Now, part of what's happening during this self-teaching process is that children are learning to recognize uh, the, the orthographic forms of particular words so that they can uh, recall the meaning directly from print, so they don't have to decode them. And in the last session, some of you may have been at Maria Korakina's talk, in which she presented data from a new child and adolescent corpus that we've built. And I'm showing here the most frequent words. This is a corpus of 1,200 books for between 7 uh, and about 16 years old. I'm showing here the most frequent words that occur in basically all the books. So you can see that if you're accessing text, you're getting some text experience, it's not going to be very long before you start to be able to, to recognize these words as whole without the need to decode them letter by letter. And during all that reading practice, you're also learning something about the statistical regularities across different words. And the most important of these is learning about morphology. Morphology is my favorite topic. And by, by morphology, what I mean is that the vast majority of words in English and in other languages are built by combining meaningful elements. Right? So we are, we are taking a stem, we're adding affixes on top of that, we're maybe combining it with another stem. And if you know something about morphology, then these 15 words here actually become just variations of a single word. Right? You don't have to learn all of them. Right? And that dramatically lightens the learning load, the orthographic learning load. And what it also does is it gives you the tools that you need to recognize and compute the meanings of words that you may not have seen before. So these are also words that occur in Maria's corpus, the child corpus. And you can see that you know, a lot of children you know, at the age of seven, eight, nine probably will not have seen these words, or they don't know these words before. But if they know something about morphology, they can start to unpick them and get to the meaning. So experimental psychology research indicates that morphological knowledge seems to arise via statistical learning through many years of text experience. Now there's also some work that suggests that morphological instruction may be valuable at some point in reading acquisition, although the jury is still out on when that might be most effective. The final sort of insight that I want to talk about is eye movements, and I think that you know, the importance of eye movements for reading has really been quite unrecognized. This is the vehicle that delivers information at the right time to the linguistic system. It determines whether to skip the next word, where to land, how long to fixate, whether to regress back, and so it's a major contributor to reading efficiency. Now, this ability is learned, and we know it's learned because people, skilled readers, exhibit an asymmetric perceptual span. And what this means is that you're able to take in more information from the periphery in the reading direction. And we know this because it's reversed in Hebrew reading. Now, the way that the eye movement system works is also tuned to specific writing systems. So for example, Chinese is a writing system that's very dense. Right? You're packing just enormous amounts of information into a very small space. 
That's very different from something like Finnish, which is a highly redundant writing system, very long words. And it turns out that the I movements are very different across these two writing systems. And I actually, this is quite new work from Simon Liversidge and his colleagues, and I actually regard it as some of the most exciting work over the past decade. Recent work from my lab also suggests that while people are taking information from the periphery, skilled readers are also making very rapid next word predictions that dynamically refine how that eye movement system works, the type of information that it's taking in. And it must be the case that those next word predictions are learned via text experience. Now, I've given you my top seven insights from reading science, and I want to turn now to thinking about how those insights, which have been gathered over the course of about 40 years, um, have shaped policy and practice around the world. And in thinking about impact, we always start with the beneficiaries. And there's no problem at all in you know, articulating the importance of this research. So reading is at the foundation of a whole host of individual outcomes. It uh, helps us to gain employment, to advocate for ourselves, to participate in the political process, to interact with each other, and it's uh, fundamentally tied to our health and well-being. But it's also associated with a whole host of social and economic outcomes. So when we think about investments in things like digital inclusion, gender equality, health, democracy around the world, we can see that those investments aren't going to be as powerful as they might be if you're dealing with a society that is not literate. And it's plainly the case that societies in which children are not learning to read have no future as an economy, right? So this is a vital, vital um, goal for the world, and that's articulated in the, in the Sustainable Development Goals. And yet for, for decades, reading science has made virtually no impact at all on how children are learned to read. And around eight years ago, I started to ask why. Okay. So why has this been so hard? Well, there's many reasons. One is that reading is really complicated, right? So you've seen that it's complex, it's multifaceted, and so what people have tended to do, they've taken an element and they've said, eye movements, reading is about eye movements. Let's do some therapy for eye movements. Let's have an intervention based on eye movements, right? So there's so many elements to reading. It's really hard to know where to even start. The second is the everyone's an expert problem, right? So we can all read, we can introspect, right? And so what you, what you find, you know, across the decades is ideas popping up to the surface and, and getting credibility based on someone's celebrity. And you will have all seen um, our, our wonderful Matt Hancock's dyslexia screening bill um, that was pushed up into Parliament, and no reading experts in the UK really can understand what this would be, all right? But, but that doesn't seem to have, have dampened his enthusiasm. There's also been very, very deep ideological divisions that have plagued this field and that have gone back absolutely decades. And this is known as the reading wars, and it, basically it's a, it's, a, it's a distinction between positions on one hand, the idea based on experimental psychology that we should be teaching children to read, using something like phonics to, to teach children how the writing system works, versus another perspective that's really about thinking that reading is a natural act and that just by immersing children in you know, a library of books, that that sort of ability will kind of come to them. There are also very powerful commercial interests in this field. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? And the people who have sold successful reading programs, including the educationalists, quite like driving around in their Maseratis. And for reasons that I don't really understand, there has been a long-standing association between different theories of reading and different political perspectives. Typically, uh, perspectives that favor phonics approaches have been tied to conservative politics, with George Bush being the most famous example and the whole Bush family um, as, a, as a political figure that was very interested in making sure that reading is evidence-based. And one of the reasons that uh, you know, Bush's reforms to, Bush had great, uh, great ideas about you know, how we should uh, be funding schools and, and his ideas that we should, we should provide funding to schools only if schools are using evidence-based reading instruction. 
But that never really got off the ground because of the deep political divisions um, in the American Congress. But you can see here, I've also included a, a tweet from the uh, former shadow education secretary who's sort of rubbishing the, um, the approach to, to reading implemented by the conservative government, which is based on phonics. So all of these things wound in together have just made this a very, very difficult problem. And of course, reading is really complicated. There's significant money to be made. And so it's been um, just an, an area beset by snake oil. And you can see from the dates of some of these that we're talking about recent times. Fish oil, colored glasses, balancing beanbags on your head, doing very expensive exercises to train your eye movements, doing Tai Chi, none of these will help a child to learn to read. But they've all bubbled to the surface, and of course parents will do almost anything to help their children to learn to read if they're struggling, including having a beanbag balanced on their head. But really, the, the thing that's been most pernicious in, the, in this domain has been an ideology called whole language and various derivatives. So I think that whole language was really based on introspective knowledge of adult reading. It feels to us like reading is a natural act, so that must be the case. And we know when we read that we don't analyze the internal structure of each word going sound by sound. We read very rapidly. We, we know we've memorized certain words. We use contextual knowledge. Sometimes we skip words. Sometimes we make pro productive guesses about the meanings of words uh, and passages. And proponents of whole language argued that this must also be the case for children. And they set about uh, developing instructional regimes that would allow children to do this. And the goal of reading materials, so I'm showing you the one on the left here. This is a, an example of what we call a look and say book. The goal of these was to get children to memorize certain words. And so whenever you would get one of these, in the first page, it would say which words are going to be memorized in this book. So you can see in this one, we see a lot of come. It's repeated over and over. Children are going to memorize that. And these books also tried to develop what these proponents called cue knowledge. So the idea was that for words that you don't memorize, you can just use different cues, pictures, context, the shape of words, the first letter, to basically guess the meaning of the word or what the word is. And we see a more recent example on the right. So you can see, again, the repetition. I like, I like, I like. And then we've got the pictures. So you can see, I like cats, I like bunnies, I like turtles, I like puppies. And of course, for whole language, it doesn't matter that I read that last one as puppies instead of dogs, because I still got the meaning right. But you must see that this sort of, of strategy for reading isn't going to be effective for very long, because we don't use pictures. And you might say, no, this is just impossible. How is it that people around the world could be teaching children to read like this? But unfortunately, this is still dominant in curricula around the world, including in Scotland and Wales. And it's, it's badged under different uh, terms, multi-queuing, balanced literacy, searchlights. Searchlights was the foundation of the national literacy strategy in the last Labour government, and reading recovery, which is still very popular. And so what we see in all of these programs are an attempt to get children to use different cues to read. So we've got something like the five-finger strategy. First, you look at the picture. Get your mouth ready. Look, look at the first letter. Guess from context. The five-finger strategy is repeated over and over in the South African curriculum, for example. Um, guessing from pictures is in the Scottish curriculum. We see in the middle, memorizing word shapes. That's not going to get you very far. In, in the corpus I mentioned, there's over 100,000 unique words in these children's books. You're not going to be able to, to memorize the shapes of those. And then I've got on the right a tweet from a few weeks ago from a practitioner of reading recovery. And the practitioner talks about the magical moment the child reads mouse as hamster using clues in the print, right? So this is not a magical moment. Reading mouse for hamster is not what you want a child to do when they're learning to read. All right, and of course, this has had consequences. So these are just an example. Um, the USA measures reading comprehension at a, a grade four. Um, these are data from California from last year. And you see that 42% of fourth graders in California are unable to read for meaning at a basic level. So they're unable to identify a basic fact in an age-appropriate uh, passage, an explicit fact. 
And you can see that this is a major equity issue. So if you are from a disadvantaged community or disadvantaged home, you're much less likely to be able to overcome the weakness in your instruction through, for example, family support or private tutoring. And studies show that children who are below basic in reading comprehension also have very, very poor decoding skills. So this is things like knowing the sounds associated with letters, being able to read individual words aloud. So what, what I've shown you here is just children who are below basic have a very high probability of being at least one standard deviation below the mean on various measures of decoding. And perhaps unsurprisingly, 81% of Californian school districts use one of three reading instruction programs, none of which is evidence-based. Right? So this just goes on and on. So I entered this debate with my wonderful friends, Anne Castles and Kate Nation, um, back in 2018. And we published a paper in Psychological Science in the Public Interest. And our goal was to write the definitive paper on how children learn to read and to show how policy and practice should be informed by that rich evidence base. And in the abstract, we wrote, it's time to end the reading wars and adopt an instructional agenda that is developmentally informed and based on a deep understanding of how language and writing systems work. We thought it's time to, it's actually time to pay attention to the evidence. It's time to, to end this. And you know, we could never have imagined the impact that this paper would have. Five years later, it's got nearly 1,200 citations, and more importantly, an altmetric attention score in the top 5,000 of the 24 million papers ever tracked. It's been the subject of blogs by teachers and parents. It's driven curriculum and assessment changes around the world. It's driven new literacy standards and targets. It's changed the approach of reading scheme publishers um, and much, much more. And for some reason, this paper, despite being 45 pages of a journal article, just really spoke to people in a way that hadn't been possible before. So why did it make such a difference? Well, one, our, we worked really hard on this to make sure that our presentation of the evidence was highly accessible. So we wrote it for teachers and the general public. And I've also indicated that it's open access. And if you want to make an impact, forget publishing behind a paywall because people just can't access it. And one of the reasons that this presentation was so accessible and so effective is that it was influenced by our personal deep knowledge of policy and practice. So for years personally, I had been attending teachers' meetings to just find out what they knew. Um, you know, what had they learned in teacher training? What didn't they know? And that helped us to structure the arguments in that paper. We were ambitious, right? We set out to write what, we, what would be the definitive article on the science of reading. And we were very lucky, and luck plays a huge role in impact. Um, we were very lucky um, for a couple of reasons. First, we had a couple of very prominent teacher influencers that took the article and then wrote books talking about how they weave their own practice in to, to capture those elements of the science. And in particular, um, this book here by a primary school teacher, which has been enormously influential, he literally goes through the whole paper and just weaves in those elements of practice to say how he does it in the classroom. We were also incredibly lucky that at the point at which we published our paper, there was a journalist, an education journalist in America called Emily Hanford, who had started asking questions about why American children were not learning to read. And she is a, she's a wonderful storyteller. She makes these podcasts, which you know, are, are listened to by millions. And what she talks about is how this paper she talks about a, about a gift on high, from on high, and she says it, it was the bridge that allowed her to connect what she'd read of the science to her interviews with parents, teachers, children, to make that understanding plain and to contextualize why things in America had gone so badly wrong. And of course, it is a strong evidence base with compelling results in the real world, and this also contributes to why this research makes a difference. So how are things changing? First, there's really rising uh, awareness of, of the problem of reading instruction in the major media. So reading is now making the big news sources like the New York Times, the LA Times, Forbes, Time Magazine. Right? 
There's also an increasing recognition of the deficiencies in instructional materials. Now, the UK is in a bit of a different place, but in America, virtually all of America buys into one of five reading instruction programs, and none of those are evidence-based. They're all based on the queuing theory, right? and there's an increasing recognition of that and pressure on those publishers to change. There are now also people in power who are listening, and that's not always the case, right? So it's another element that's very lucky. Um, so we've seen over uh, one third of US states either considering reading instruction legislation or that has it already on the books. So this is legislation that requires schools to use instructional methods that are evidence-based. We've also seen court challenges that have been successful in which parents and pupils have successfully sued their school districts for not teaching them how to read properly. We've seen new policy commitments and assessments being rolled out in Australia to ensure that uh, reading instruction is evidence-based. We're also seeing inquiries into, in other nations, such as Canada, the right to read inquiry, asking questions around how things have gone so badly wrong. And legislation and policy seems to now be moving every day. And as some states and nations adopt more evidence-based approaches, and we see evidence of that, for example, um, what's been called the Mississippi miracle, it's not a miracle, they're just actually using the evidence. Um, legislators and parents have started to ask questions about why their states and school districts aren't doing the same. And of course, none of this could happen without teachers on boards. And there are many, many grassroots efforts springing up all over the world, allowing teachers to come together and to learn about the science of reading and the science of learning more broadly. And that is material that they were not taught and by and large still are not taught in teacher training. And it was through these organizations, Research Ed in particular, that I started having the opportunity to engage with teachers to find out what they knew and, and maybe how I could pitch our research to make it more accessible to them. So I haven't talked much about England's journey, and that's because England has bucked the trend in a, sort of a variety of ways. It started its journey to evidence-based instruction much earlier. So England's journey started in 2006 which, with the Rose Review. So this was a review, an expert review, um, commissioned, and they came to the conclusion that systematic explicit phonics should be the prime approach to establishing word recognition in initial reading. So instead of using the queuing theory where we guess based on pictures and, and first letters. A year later, the government distributed resources uh, for, for schools called Letters and Sounds. This was a very large curriculum document aligning with the, the Rose Review and teaching, basically telling schools how they should be teaching reading. Now, five years went by, we had a change of government, and then the conservative government strengthened that even further. They brought in something called the phonics screen. So the phonics screen is a very simple test that's given to children at the end of year one when they're five or six. And it's a test of reading aloud. It's 20 words and 20 non-words. And the point of that is just to see whether children can decode those words using their phonics. So particularly non-words, you know, you can't memorize these, so you've got to decode them. And here are some of the data from the first few years of that. So what happens is children get the test in year one, and if they don't pass, they get an intervention and then take it again in year two. So you can see the darker lines, that's the year two kids that have to retake the test, and they're all scoring very well. There's a couple things I want to point out. The first is that in the first year of this test, only 58% of readers could pass the test. This is a very, very simple test. And this is five years after phonics instruction became a legal requirement in England schools. So it shows that you, know, you, you actually need um, some sort of assessment or, or evaluation tool to make sure that these things are being done well. And in the initial evaluation of the phonics screen, about half of schools reported that they used the, the results of the phonics screen to refine their own performance. We then seen um, dramatic rises, and there's about 660,000 primary school children in each grade so each percentage point, you know, it's 6,000 additional readers who are passing that and having the foundational skills to become good readers. In 2021, the government further published core criteria for phonics programs and implemented a validation process for reading instruction programs. 
And this is very important because it means that schools now can select a reading instruction program that's been validated by experts in reading. Um, they don't have to rely on marketing to choose. And that's been a, a real big problem in the US. And interestingly, you know, this policy shift has been remarkable because typically it's very unusual for policies to come in that are unpopular, right? Policies usually come in when there's popularity. This was incredibly unpopular, the phonics screen. Teachers didn't want to do it, schools didn't want to do it, the general public didn't know enough. And there was substantial pushback from the unions and from the academic education community. People said it's likely to have a detrimental effect. Phonics is just barking at print. It has nothing to do with reading for meaning. And even last year, uh, scholars from the Institute for Education said it's uninformed and failing children. But we're starting to see the results of this policy shift now. So what I'm showing you here are data from the PEARLS assessment. So this is an international comparative study of reading administered every five years when children are 10. Um, and you can see the ranking of the nations on the right. Now, you know, there's loads of things that go into these rankings. There's tons of, of policy shift. There's different, um, you know, there's different factors that go into to school performance. But England in 10 years has moved to mid-table to, to very near the top of the table. And we're now, we're now have readers that are achieving better than any nation in Europe, the USA, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. And the key driver of reading comprehension performance in the PEARLS test at age 10 is phonics screen performance in year one. And that's um, denoted here in this graph. This is the phonics performance in year one. And this is the PEARLS reading comprehension performance when children are 10. Now, this is a correlation with all that, that uh, the limitation that that implies. But I think it's, it does two things. First, I think it diffuses the argument that, that poor reading is all about poverty. It's not, right? Phonics is a stronger predictor of reading comprehension than whether a child is on free school meals, whether there's internet in the home, whether they um, are English as an additional language, um, a variety of personal characteristics. The other thing I think it diffuses is the argument that phonics is barking at print, that it has nothing to do with reading for meaning. It clearly has something to do with reading for meaning. Of course, this is just a start because a child reading at the end of, of year one or at the end of year four is very different from a skilled reader. And there's a lot still to do to implement reading science um, as children progress, for example, through <coughs> secondary school. So I want to um, do the last part of my talk by talking about what I regard as the next target for reading science. Um, and it's a, it's a new collaboration that I'm really excited about. So the data I'm showing you are from a recent World Bank report. And I've plotted the, the percentage of children who at the age of 10 are what we call below baseline in reading comprehension. So what this means is that they could not pick out an explicit fact from an age appropriate passage. And we can see that that number is about 9% in high income countries, which resonates with a number of other surveys. But we can see that that starts to creep up in the upper and lower middle income countries. And by the time we get to the low income countries, we're talking about 90% of children not learning to read. And all the indications suggest that this is getting even worse post pandemic. Now, the really interesting thing about this is that in the last 20 years, we've made incredible strides at getting children into primary school. So what I'm showing you on the left is a graph of the share of primary age children who are not in school. And you can see over that 20 year period that that's gone way down. So we're now at a stage where about 90% of children globally are enrolled in primary school. They're in school, but they're not learning effectively. Now, there are many, many causes of this. For example, it's very difficult to train a teacher workforce in the global south. These contexts are often multilingual. So children speak a variety of home languages. Um, they come to, to the classroom, and often they're taught to read in what's regarded to be an economically valuable language. So in, in about 40% of cases for children, um, they might be taught to read in English or French or Portuguese, even though they don't know that language. There's a lack of books, particularly in, in, in some of the, the, um, the languages that are not spoken that don't have high prevalence. There's infrastructure problems. But from my perspective, the, 
th the main problem at this stage is that reading science is almost entirely detached from this field. It's like the field doesn't even know that there's a body of knowledge about how children learn to read. And indeed, literacy is a major target for international development assistance. We're talking billions every single year spent on literacy in um, low and middle income country contexts. This field is entirely dominated by economists, policy experts, politics and international relations scholars, and it has had vanishing little interaction with any form of reading science. And what that means is that all the frameworks that they're producing for instruction and assessment are not aligned at all with reading science. So here's an example. This is the global proficiency framework. It's a protocol for reading instruction from grades one to nine. It's been agreed by all the major development or agencies around the world. But it doesn't make any sense from a reading science perspective. It's almost entirely focused on comprehension. And in 152 pages, it doesn't mention the word phonics once. And I think that this is an example of the everyone's an expert problem, right? Reading is easy. We can all do it. So this is a new collaboration with a colleague, a couple of colleagues in the World Bank. And one of the things we've been doing is developing a database of children's reading subskills in the developing world. And so there's something called the EGRA. The EGRA is the Early Grade Reading Assessment. It was introduced in 2007, and it was developed by an international aid agency called USAID. And it was basically to use in their sort of different evaluation pr projects for literacy. And it's modeled on something called Dibbles. Dibbles is a tool used very frequently in the USA to measure different components of reading. So the tasks in EGRA are basically equivalent to Dibbles, but they're in multiple languages that would be relevant in low and, and middle income countries. Now, the thing is that these EGRAs are never published in academic articles, but you might find them in different repositories and in reports, and anything that receives US foreign aid, they're required to make their data available, although it's not always in a form that's um, that usable. So we collected every EGRA that we could find over the last 15 years. And so what we've got, we've got 347 EGRAs. They're, these are often very, very large studies that'll have multiple sub-studies in them of different languages. So those 347 EGRAs, they, they cover 62 countries, 118 languages, over 32,000 schools, and over 700,000 pupils. And you can see that most of those are for alphabetic writing systems although we also have other writing systems represented. And so what I've done here is to plot EGRA scores for four decoding tasks. So the decoding tasks that we're looking at are letter name identification, I'm sorry this is so small, letter sound identification, non-word reading, and oral reading fluency. Oral reading fluency is just how many words can you read aloud in a minute. All of these are timed tests. So how many letters can you name in a minute, for example? And each dot represents a, the average of a whole sample, right? We don't have the individual data. And what I've done here is I've plotted Dibble's benchmarks uh, for what we call substantial risk and severe risk. So the substantial risk benchmark means anyone below that would require additional support Anyone below the red benchmark, that's a severe risk of reading failure. Now, the, the benchmarks we used are from the USA. So they're, they're English benchmarks. They're from a high-income country. So there's all sorts of limitations to that. But we do not have adequate benchmarks for the low, uh, these low-income countries. And what you can see is that a vast percentage of the data fall below both benchmarks. So these are for tasks as simple as knowing the names of letters. And although there's evidence that pupils are improving a little bit from year to year, you can see those performance gaps widening each year too. And so by the time we get to the third year of reading instruction, this is year one, year two, and year three, virtually all of the data is underneath those benchmarks. And what that means is that these children are not developing the foundational skills to, to get the exit velocity to be able to access text and do all of that statistical learning, right? They're not even getting out of the starting blocks. And in some ways, this is a very <coughs> trivial set of graphs because what it shows is that just children aren't being taught their letters and what letters represent. And that's actually really consistent with a curriculum review I've just done in South Africa 
which shows they're spending a lot of time sort of holding books and playing with books and being read to, but there's very little actual instructional time going on. And what we can see is that there's a very tight link from these skills to reading comprehension. So these are cases in which we also have a reading comprehension measure for these children. And so there's a clear policy response. The, the policies at the moment are entirely focused on things like developing a situation model. This is a core of reading comprehension. Inferencing. You actually need to shift to the first critical point of reading failure, which is knowing what letters are, what they represent, being able to, to lift the words off the page um, to decode. So I think that these findings are going to make a big difference in this space. But it's not all about just publishing papers. And so these are some of the things I've been doing with the World Bank over the last few years. So we've managed to um, change their policy goals, what they think that they can achieve by implementing reading science into their protocols. I try to explain reading science to anyone who will listen. So there's a lot of explaining and persuading going on. Um, I've collaborated with the World Bank on the development of teacher resources for use in the developing world. And probably the most important are the two in the middle. First, impact just can't happen without relationships. And this is often down to a lucky break of finding someone that wants to listen to you and that you want to talk to over perhaps many years. And the last point is just to say how much I've learned personally from engaging in this work. So working in a development context has really taught me that building an evidence base based on high income, monolingual, English speaking contexts, first of all, it's just not good enough. Uh, but the other thing is it deprives us a lot of the richness of, of what it means to get to grips with written language. And, and we can get a lot of that from the writing systems. Um, in these low and middle income countries. So I would say that you know, working with the World Bank has actually been one of the most valuable experiences of my career. So it's time to turn to my final insights um, and conclusions. And one thing that has struck me through this period has been that we've made an impact because we know the why. We know why phonics works and we can explain it. And that's what we did in our paper. And the reason we know the why is because we, we conduct fundamental research that addresses cause. So you know, sometimes people think that there's a tension between fundamental research and impact. There's no tension. There can't be impact without the fundamental research. I've also learned that storytelling is very important. Um, so you know, telling, retelling your story in a way that resonates. You know, if it doesn't work the first time, tell it another way the next time. And you've seen here that there are many routes to influence. I think when I talk to people about impact, people want to go for policy right away. But there's so many other routes. There's training. There's materials. There's raising awareness. There's developing relationships. And all of them contribute to making a difference. I've also been really struck, as I said, by the extent to which the external engagement has inspired new research questions. So we often think of impact as being unidirectional but it has been so bi-directional in this case. And finally, you know, our careers are really long. And um, you know, sometimes we want to get out of the lab. And, and I have actually just found this really personally fulfilling. And you know, it might be that this research, this, this work stalls. And then I say, OK, I'm going to spend more time on, on some of the fundamental research. But it's something that you can add to your career that I think at least it's given me a great sense of personal fulfillment. So I want to end with a final thought, and it's a quote by the distinguished reading scientist Mark Seidenberg, and it's a quote he made on National Public Radio in 2017. The reading wars are over, and science lost. And I must say, in 2017, you know, we're hearing about fish oil and Tai Chi. It really did feel like we'd reached the end of the road, and we just weren't going to be able to connect with anyone. And then the next year, everything started to change. Um, so I guess my final message is one about tenacity, um, that your message may be heard in a different way at a different time. And I think there's probably a wider lesson there. So thank you very much.
Thank you.